All right, welcome to an oil and gas webinar. I'm Doug Sinatare, oil and gas market manager here at Carboline. We are at AMP Bring on the Heat 2021 from Pasadena, Texas. I'm here with my colleague, Cabot Wilkinson, who's business development manager for fireproofing. Cabot, tell us a little about your role. Yeah, um, so first off, I've been with the company for a little over two years, uh, but served 14 years in the passive fire protection market. Um, it's what I live, eat, and breathe. Um, went to Oklahoma State, uh, fire protection engineering. Um, and, you know, some of the things that I do within the company is, you know, I help navigate um, the contract chain from uh, the owner level down to the applicator level, making sure that we're following uh, the contract chain, making sure that we're getting uh, all the pieces put together uh, so we can do the best that we can as a company to win a project. Good. So you mentioned OSU. I have to ask Oklahoma State. Sure. Yeah. Some people refer to a poke. Tell us what's a poke. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Oklahoma State uh, cowboy uh, short term would be a poke. Uh, so I guess maybe, uh, you know, in the early 20s, they were, they were a little lazy, didn't want to be called cowboys. So uh, they coined the term poke. And, uh, you know, that's what it is. Uh, it's uh, Pistol Pete's our, our mascot. And he was, you know, one of the most famous cow pokes of, of, of uh, recent decades. Well, there you go. So we're, we're a manufacturer along with others who uh, supply and support passive fireproofing materials, PFP. What's required these days from a manufacturer, things you've seen to support large projects? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, history is, is important. You know, Carboline as a company has been in the business uh, of passive fireproofing for a little over 40 years. Uh, you know, we have the legacy line of our Fire Creek 241 and, uh, you know, Thermalag 3000 at 21 years. Uh, so, you know, that's important, right? We have documented um, uh, history with, with our products being involved in actual events. So we, have, we bring a lot of history to the table. Uh, we have a lot of square feet covered uh, across the globe. So that's, you know, very important. You know, that establishes credibility within the industry. Um, you know, we also need to make sure that the products that we manufacture can address all the needs. So, you know, that's not just making a product and putting it out to market. It's doing all the back end testing uh, to accompany the hazards that we can face uh, on any given project. Good. So the industry's gotten bigger. There's a lot of discussion around PFP. We're obviously at AMP Bring on the Heat, yep. an event dedicated to CUI and other things, but a lot around fire protection. What are some of the most talked about things in PFP right now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords going around the industry right now. I think uh, regression is a big one. Um, you know, regression is looking at, um, you know, the, the, the steel factor and uh, understanding, you know, what the weight is and, and how that material can be applied. Could be less, could be more. Uh, so that's a pretty uh, important thing that's going on right now. Uh, we see CSP protection uh, becoming more and more prominent. Um, you know, it's not just LNG facilities that, um, you know, could see CSP releases. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have products that can accommodate that. Not only that, we have to make sure that the products that we put out uh, can be, uh, you know, pr have proven performance uh, when exposed to a pre-fire event and then to a UL hydrocarbon fire event. Um, and, you know, we could also look at jet fire. So there's a lot of things in the industry, um, you know, testing is becoming more prescriptive. Specs are becoming more prescriptive, meaning that uh, it's not a one size fits all approach anymore. Yeah, good point. And speaking of one size fits all, you know, what we have seen in the industry from the manufacturing perspective is either manufacturers have a cementitious product or an epoxy product. Carboline has both. What's the advantage of having both products well, to you support? Yeah, we have a lot of tools in our belt, right? Uh, we, we can go to a job site and we can work with an owner, uh, work with an EPC, and be able to uniquely use our products to address certain hazards within the plant. And inherently, uh, when you do that, you could look at a cost savings um, with that. You could also look at our extensive testing that we've done, uh, especially when it comes to regression. If we're able to reduce the material that goes on the steel, you know, we could be saving uh, a significant amount of money in material loan on a project. Yeah, yeah. So thinking of projects, let's, let's stay along in that theme. What are some of the biggest challenges we're seeing today related to the PFP or passive fire protection process? You know, and think about this from the feed or, or beginning stage all the way to to the field application. You know, what are, what are maybe some things you've been working with clients on related to this? 
you know, I think the most important thing is to get us involved early. Um, get us involved early, get us involved often. Um, what's, what's unique is, you know, you'll, you'll go work with an owner and they may, may not always have a good understanding of what exactly the passive fire protection does. So they look at it and they say, well, we're just going to do a belt and suspenders approach and we're going to use one thickness and we're not going to look at this uh, from a more uh, analytical manner. And, you know, can we utilize, uh, you know, less material or could we do this? Could we do that? Uh, they don't know those things, so they don't ask those questions. They just continue to do what they had done on previous projects. Um, you know, another thing that we see is, you know, failures with galvanized steel. Um, you know, if you're putting an epoxy coating on, you're, you're putting a primer down regardless of how that steel comes into your facility. So the other thing that we could look at is, uh, you know, doing what's right or what's specified uh, versus weighing that out on, on the commercial benefit. Um, you know, not that people cut corners, but sometimes they may always have what's in the best interest of their company, not what's listed in the specification. Yeah, good point. So if I'm an engineer or operator, part of, a big part of, passive fire protection is really the material selection process. There's evaluations, you mentioned testing, but what are maybe some things that are undervalued or not considered enough that you've seen in your experience relating to material selection? I think, you know, first off is, does the material fit to what the design need is for? Um, you know, how does the performance look? What back-end testing has been done, um, you know, for CSP, jet fire, environmentals, um, does the material fit that need of that project. Um, longevity, you know, they design an asset to last 20, 30, 40 years. Is the product that's being applied going to withstand that duration? Um, will there need to be a maintenance plan in place to ensure that it, it meets those benchmarks and lasts, you know, for the lifetime of the asset? Yeah, good, good points there. So given the recent failure of rigid epoxies, there's a lot, uh, of talk around different materials and what fits. So where where does Thermalag 3000 fit in that scenario? Yeah, you know, Thermalag 3000 is is a uh, you know poly polysulfide based material, so it's you know cures like a hard rubber. Um, you know, does have great physical properties. Um, you know, is uh, you know does not see a lot of damage, uh, even though it is a, a less hard material, um, but. You know, we, we've run some extensive testing with our uh, NACE TMO304 program. Um, in fact, uh, Thermalag 3000 uh, was cycled 225 times throughout that uh, test procedure. Uh, we saw no failures. We saw no delamination. Uh, I know that we ran other materials uh, through that same test parameter, and we were seeing failures within five cycles. So unlike rigid materials, uh, when you have a, uh, a product that's able to uh, expand and contract with the metal, uh, what you find is that it doesn't delaminate, it doesn't crack in, in the web to flange interface. Uh, so Thermalag 3000 is you know, very suitable. In fact, if you look back to uh, some of the recommendations out of API 2218, um, you know, they specifically say that the, the material that goes over the steel needs to be able to be flexible uh, to accommodate the expansion contraction of the steel. Yeah, yeah. So we talked a lot about capital projects up to this point. Let's shift a little bit in the maintenance and repair scenario. And specifically, we talked about testing. That's important, always will be. Um, talk to us a little bit about a recent scenario where we had a 20-year case history in a coker unit in a refinery in Texas. Walk us through what we did, what we found, and maybe some results there. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we, you know, we were contacted by an owner to come evaluate some uh, applied fireproofing that was uh, put in place in roughly around 2001. Uh, so we know, looking at the weather history from 2001 to, to now, that it's been through several tropical events, uh, meaning lots of rain, it's potentially been flooded, um, the material could have been submerged underwater, um, the plant itself was sitting uh, right on Galveston Bay, uh, so we know that you know it, it could be susceptible to any one of those events. So. For us, we were looking at that as we wanted to address, you know, water absorption, uh, you know, some of the things that have been used uh, to sell against our product. And, uh, you know, looking at that example at a C5 environment, um, we were able to uh, pull the material off, cut samples out. And in fact, uh, one thing we noticed when, when we cut the material out, that the bond 
uh, of the primer was so strong in the in the also uh, thermal lag to that primer that when we cut it out we pulled primer off uh, mm. the sample area. So we took the uh, cured sample, the aged sample of thermal lag 3000, uh, back to the lab. Uh, we made an identical virgin material sample, uh, ran it through a test to uh, measure the uh, intumescent properties of the material, and we found that uh, the cured uh, virgin sample and, and the 20-year uh, sample saw no loss in physical property uh, compared against the control, which is the virgin sample. So, uh, you know, we inherently knew that material that's been applied in the, in the field in a, in a coastal environment uh, will perform, if not even better than a virgin piece of material. Yeah, that's a great, great bit of info. And perhaps any more of these similar scenarios that we're Going yes. to be looking at in the future. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, we started in, in a in a tropical type environment. You know, humidity uh, against the coast. Uh, we're, yes, we are going to go inland. We're going to look at uh, cold environments. Uh, we're going to look at uh, dry environments, high heat environments. Uh, so you know, as a company that has a twenty plus year legacy with Thermalag three thousand, we're able to go look at uh, these applications. We're able to pull material off and analyze how it performs against the control. So great info there, Kevin, on that on that history. And, and speaking of that, for for an application and a project to last that long, twenty years is a long time. There's a lot of th things that go into to making it successful. As a manufacturer, you have to manufacture the product properly and as as specified. But the application has to be right and done well, and that's a big deal. Down days, as you know, there's so much more square feet. The projects are bigger. There's a lot of pacifier protection being applied. So talk to us a little bit. You work with up and down the contract chain. Talk to us about the importance of having a, a qualified and experienced applicator to apply these materials. Yeah, you know, great question. Uh, you know, Carboline is the uh, company of the applicator, um, as we like to say. Uh, so we, we always drive for quality install. Um, you know, we make good high quality products. We want those products installed by the best contractors. Um, with projects becoming more globally, becoming larger, uh, high square footages of, of coated uh, pacifier protection that goes out on a project, um, you could have five different applicators in five different regions installing. Um, so you have to have good training and, and it starts with that applicator. Um, we have to train each individual who's going to apply that material. Um, and I think uh, in the future, you'll see that uh, we could be doing training uh, for both field contractors and shop contractors because the environments are totally different. Uh, you know, the advantage that we see now with shop work is that it's material being applied in almost the best conditions possible. Um, and then it goes out to the field where they install uh, for blockouts. So uh, we have to accommodate and adapt our training methods to ensure that the highest quality standards are met uh, from our point of view. Yep, all good stuff. Well, Cabot, thanks for joining me today to talk all things fireproofing. We appreciate you all tuning in and look forward to more oil and gas content. And we're signing off here from Bring On the Heat 2021. We'll see you soon.